imagery is rapidly getting better and better and essentially each year opens new possibilities. And there's a huge flood of new imagery coming in every day. So it's not possible to analyze it all manually and we need tools, we need machine learning models to actually unlock the full potential of this data. So from this presentation, you will learn what is the current state of the art when it comes to the available data from satellites that we have and what types of data and sources of uh, satellite data we have out there. I will also share our experiences with applying R and deep learning methods to satellite imagery. So let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Marek. Uh, it's my second time at uh, USAR, this time in Brisbane. So it's great to have a chance to visit Australia. Um, I'm the CTO at Epsilon Data Science and we work with companies in different industries and we build with them, for them, end-to-end -end data science solutions. Uh, so basically we focus on data models and interface and we use R a lot in all three. So here are examples of our clients like BCG, Diversity, very large companies, but we have also Natural Forest Agency of Canada and uh, a VC fund uh, based, based in London. So we're really proud to have such fantastic clients. And, and essentially we put a huge emphasis on correctness testing, automated validation of data quality, and also on great user interface and user experience in the apps that we build. And we also contribute to our community with open source. So there are several packages uh, and they are mostly focused on bringing great user experience to Shiny. So be sure to check them out and come to me if you want to get some Hex stickers. Um, all right, so uh, let's start with this. Why satellite imagery? What data exactly do we have available? And what parameters of the data are important when we're choosing the uh, source of data? So why satellites? Well, satellite images are a unique thing. We get regular coverage of essentially the whole Earth, which I think is really amazing, and they're easily available. And by that, I mean that it's really very easy to get them. You don't need to deploy a drone. You don't need to send an air airplane uh, to get them. You simply download them, and you don't need to wait. And also, they are quite cheap. Uh, some of them are available for free, and they're pretty good, uh, and it's, it's not that expensive to get uh, even higher quality photos. Uh, and this is improving rapidly. So currently we have more than 1,700 uh, satellites around Earth, and the most recent information I found is that 200 out of these are imagery satellites, but uh, I know that one provider uh, has already 170, so I suspect that this number is, uh, the overall number is even bigger. Mm. Anyway, ab above 200. And the best resolution that we can get uh, gives us one pixel per each square, uh, 25 by 25 centimeters. Uh, so imagine a standing person seen from above, this person will give us around three pixels, uh, which is amazing, I think. Mm. So there's a number of providers, and what's most important to know here is that we have public programs like Sentinel and Landsat, uh, which give us uh, free photos that are good enough for many use cases. And we have several commercial providers where you can get even better photos, and they're really making huge improvements uh, every month. So let's see what are the most important parameters that we need to consider when choosing the source of data. So first, obviously, there's the spatial resolution. The bigger the resolution, the more details we can see uh, in the image. Um, but there are some trade-offs as well, which we'll discuss soon. And on this plot, you can see how the spatial resolution changed over the years. So in 1970, we started with 100 meters. Uh, and now we are down to 25 or 30 centimeters. So different colors here correspond to different sensors. The best resolution we get for um, the blue dots, which are visible light sensors, and other sensors generally have a bit lower resolution. Um, so, but the thing is that spatial resolution is not the only res type of resolution that we need to consider when 
designing um, solutions based on uh, satellite imagery. Equally important, or sometimes even more important, uh, is the temporal resolution, uh, as we can call it. That is, how often do we get the data for a given area? Uh, or in other words, what is the revisit time? So here you can see the temporal resolution on the vertical axis and spatial resolution on the um, horizontal axis uh, for different missions that are out there. And as you can see, the values range from 25 days to less than one day, uh, mostly one day, but there are also already uh, satellites that give us an image of a certain place twice a day. Uh, so I, I think this is really impressive. And these revisit times will keep getting smaller and smaller. So this is especially significant in, um, since uh, clouds are a big challenge in satellite imagery. Um, and the more images we get, the higher the chance that we'll get a clear view of the ground. So we have spatial, we have temporal, uh, but that's not all. Uh, there is also the spectral resolution. So of course we get RGB images of the visible light band, uh, but we also get much more. Uh, we get a number of other bands, uh, and it depends on the satellite program which ranges are, are available. So, um, for example, uh, Matt already mentioned today uh, the NDVI indicator, uh, which is based on near-infrared, and it's heavily used in agriculture, for example. Uh, yeah, and I, I mentioned that clouds are a big challenge, and on the right here you can see a, an image of a certain area in Indonesia. And as you can see, the, our view is obstructed by clouds. And, but there's one option that, that can help us with clouds, uh, which is radar. Uh, and on the left, you can see the same area seen on the radar. Um, and we are getting more and more radar images as well uh, recently. So this is great because radar can see through the clouds. And this can be crucial in some applications. So the current state of the art is 25 centimeters resolution, images twice a day. But bear in mind that uh, each of these characteristics you get in a different satellite mission. So you cannot get both at the same time. So choose wisely depending on uh, your use case. So I'd, I'd like to also emphasize that higher spatial resolution is not always the best uh, because there are always trade-offs. So with lower spatial resolution, you can get higher temporal resolution, higher, uh, higher spectral resolution. You can get lower cost. You can get higher consistency and availability of the images. But also smaller images, if they are good enough for you, uh, they are generally easier to process. Uh, so, so they might be just better. OK, so this is great. Now, why is R? also for analyzing satellite images. Um, I will share our experiences, so what has worked for us and what has not worked for us. Um, so there are some things in our experience that are worth doing outside R, in particular any large pre-processing of uh, huge images, like cutting out smaller areas, calculating indicators on a large area, or um, in general, all resource intensive uh, operations. It was just for us uh, smoother and nicer and faster and just easier to do this outside of R. Uh, essentially on platforms where we can easily process huge amounts of data uh, in cloud. All right, so with that out of the way, let's get to why R is great and where it really shines. So first of all, for us it's dashboards um, because it's not it's crucial not only to get accurate uh, analytics, but also to build tools to support uh, using this, these analytics and to put the insights to use. Second, it's all kinds of data analysis after we calculate indicators like features uh, from the images. Um, so once we are working on, on the regular data set, uh, R uh, performs great. And third, it's... Um, training deep learning models with our interfaces to Keras and also to H2O. So this is an example of a dashboard that 
helps analyze and makes decisions uh, regarding agriculture. Uh, and I know this looks much better than typical shiny dashboards, but it really is possible to achieve this level of user interface in Shiny. Mm. And also with uh, all the packages around Shiny, like Leaflet and so on, we can visualize, uh, for example, different indicators in a very helpful way. So Shiny is uh, really great for building tools around satellite data. And now when it comes to deep learning, uh, one example that I can share is uh, detecting vessels on satellite images. So this is a simple example, but a really nice one. Uh, in this case, we have a labeled set of 2,800 images from Kaggle, and the task is to determine whether what we are seeing is a vessel or not. Uh, and this can be hard even for a human. Uh, but we can do this with R and Keras, uh, so let's see. So the first thing we do is uh, since this is not a huge data set, uh, especially for deep learning, uh, we start with data augmentation. So, uh, for example, rotating the, uh, the training images. And for some cases, we can use... Keras also has some built-in aug augmentation, uh, but this can be really nicely done with R. Um, especially if what we're doing is not so typical, uh, it's something non-standard, um, R is really nice to, to augment the data. All right, now uh, this is the architecture of a network that worked quite well for this problem. So we have two convolution layers followed by max pooling, then again two convolution layers and then ma max pooling. And at the end we have soft max. And we also use dropout to avoid overfitting. So defining this kind of uh, network in R for Keras uh, is, is really nice and smooth, and training goes, uh, goes smooth as well. And on, on this problem, this network gives 98% uh, accuracy. So if you'd like to learn more about this case, you can check out uh, an article about it written uh, by Michal Mai on our blog. So uh, looking at the bigger picture, uh, I'd also like to discuss a typical architecture of a complete solution, uh, because I believe this is important and, and helpful. Um, so at the beginning, there's always some data source. So this can be either a platform like Google Earth or AWS Earth, where we already have images. Um, or we can get the images directly from image providers like Digital Globe or Planet Labs. And now we need to do something with these images. So for example, pre-process them to extract areas of interest or compute indicators, or sometimes we need to store them locally for future use. So we have a pre-processing layer or a pre-processing service. So here we may need large resources, so it's worth building this on components in the cloud. Mm, so here we typically use Google or AWS Cloud, and this is where we don't use R. Mm. So what we found is that uh, we often need to access the service in two ways. One is batch to get the training data, for example, and the other one is uh, on demand, where we, uh, in cases we don't know the particular area our user will be interested in. So, interested in. So, so we need to get this image when the user tells us what what the area, what is the area he needs to see. Uh, so this service has two endpoints for each of these types of access. Um, and the next part is model training, uh, which we typically do with R and Keras. And this training works on the pre-processed data from the previous layers. Um, so the result here is a trained model. And now we need to run this model on the data as they come. So, and again, this can be done in two ways. In some cases, we have a large area, but we know what the area is. Uh, so we have a batch uh, job that uses data pre-processed also in the batch way, and we run the trained model on these data and save the results in the database so that they can be later used. Um, and in other cases, we don't know the area, so we expose from R an API to the model, and this API talks to the pre-processing layer, gets the image, uh, then runs the model, and uh, returns the results. 
And the final important piece is the interface. So here we have a shiny dashboard which uses the previous layer. So it either reads from the database or uses the API. Uh, so this allows the user to interact with the images, with the insights, and with the model so, so that they can actually benefit from them. Um, so before we finish, let's quickly take a look at some emerging applications of this type of models. So these are just a few examples, uh, but we'll be seeing more and more of these uh, in the future. So one is agriculture, where farmers can use satellite-based models to monitor fields, to manage crops, to improve yields. And precision farming means that you can essentially plug a model into your machine that is working in the fields to supply, supply to a given part of the field exactly what it, what it needs. Uh, so this is growing very fast. Second is real estate. So for example, construction companies can monitor what their competition is building. Uh, they can benchmark also their, their own performance against the competition. Um, and also we can monitor city growth trends um, like by counting the number of cars, the new buildings that are appearing and so on. And by the way, this is, this is a re recent image of the building that we are in right now. Uh, right, and third example, finance and insurance. So for example, we can forecast supermarket chain revenue based on the number of cars parked in front of its stores. Um, also traders can analyze transport and storage of resources such as oil and especially in this area also the time travel capability. So the, the uh, thing that we can look at the images from the past is very powerful for fraud detection. So R is an amazing tool for analyzing satellite data. Uh, so use it, use it well and share, share your experiences with the community. Thank you. Yeah, so, so the question is about the, how many images were in the training set. Yes. I, think, I think it was 2,800 images in the training set. So after augmentation by rotating it, uh, we get four times that. And I think the validation set was, um, was separate. But uh, to get the details, we, we would need to check in the blog post. Uh, that's what I think. Right, so, so one example of the tool that uh, gives us a lot of power and uh, ability to move fast is Google Earth, which, where you can write small programs that compute indicators, uh, and these programs are run by Google somewhere in their uh, data centers directly on the data. So. Uh, so it's very fast, and we get only the, uh, the indicators that we need for the, for the given area. So, so in this example, uh, we, uh, we cannot use R because uh, I think they only support JavaScript, uh, which is interesting, by the way. Uh, yeah, and, and this, like, this really takes a lot of burden from us. Uh, so that's one example. And uh, other examples are... Um, we sometimes pre-process uh, pre the data in uh, using like uh, tools that are like uh, complete programs. And so we write a bash script, for example, that runs programs uh, that, that are already out there. Uh, and that, that's also fast. I believe it's uh, it's more than a few cents. It's it's more like uh, tens or hundreds of dollars uh, per image when we are talking about the, like the highest resolution ones. But you can also get some subscriptions, and uh, yeah, so it depends on how many images you you want. <laughs> 